And anyone who thinks that uh, police brutality is not real, not in Canada, not here, not anywhere, again, they're humans. Um, do you have an older brother? He dominates the younger brother. That's human behavior, right? Yeah. That's just how it works. Mm-hmm. You go to school, you're in high school, the big kid generally dominates the other kids. Right. That's how it works. Everyone who has power wants to exert that power over everyone else. Right. And we just have to make sure that when you have the kind of power that police have, that there's consequences mm-hmm. when you overreach. Yeah. It, it cannot just be like uh, put under the rug and you know, it didn't happen or slap on the wrist. No, they have to, they have to be forceful mm-hmm. with their decisions. And I have to commend uh, the uh, Minneapolis police chief. I can't believe he fired those guys in 24 hours. That's never happened before. Mm-hmm. But he's obviously a human. Right. And any human watching that video is going to say, what was that? Right. Like, I have four of my guys out there. Yeah. None of them did anything to say, whoa, whoa, yeah. we can't do this. I just want to go back for a second, too. And I, you sort of talk about the additional officers that were there. I want to go back to sort of the security thing. I've been in situations as well where either as a supervisor or as someone who was being supervised, I've been in situations where fellow colleagues of mine, when we were dealing with aggressive people and dealing with arrests, who they themselves were being a little heavy handed and you're like, okay, like the person's under control. But you have to have the guts, which I've done. Yeah. Is to say, okay, dude, enough. Like, we're good. You know, you don't you 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 cannot have this mindset that I'm too embarrassed for one reason or the other to stand up. The, the way I feel is like, as a, as a police officer, your job is to have integrity, right? You, you're upholding the law. Yeah. The law is supposed to be something that maintains law and order. And you have to have the utmost integrity. And that means that even if someone on your own team is doing something incorrectly, you reprimand them for that. Yeah. And reprimand doesn't mean you have to fire them, but to knock them in, like, dude, no, like enough. And been in situations where you have to stand back and go, you know, what? okay, if, if if you don't want to listen to me, then I'm out of here. You're on your own. You're going to continue with that guy on the floor. I'm not, I don't want any part of this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's, I don't understand why someone would allow themselves to sort of be in that same space. Um, I mean, I have reason to believe that it's like that because, again, it's that brotherhood, sisterhood, right? You don't want yeah. to be the odd man out. You don't want to be the one in the locker room later saying, oh, see, this guy doesn't have our back and he's a traitor and... Oh, yeah. That's that. And I'm sure that happens. Yeah. Of course it yeah. happens. Right. So I, the question I want to ask you, though, it's kind of is two part because I, I think w- what we want to do is is really look at because we could be here and we can talk about all the negative and all the things yeah. that the police are doing or not doing. Um, but I, I really want to start looking at I posted this on my social media the other day. It's really like, where do we go from here? Like we can talk about, you know, people say all oh, the riots and. People are for it, people are against it, and the looting and all that. Put that aside for a second. Really want to start having a conversation and a dialogue about what are the types of things that can. Because here's here's what kind of gets me. George Floyd is not the first incident. Yeah. And it won't be the last. And it won't be the last. And you, you sometimes say, okay, well, we've had all these incidents. Doesn't matter what state it was in, we've had all these incidents. And whether the cop gets tried and convicted or not, we're still having the same conversation many, many, many years later. So what are the things that we need to see done to start? Because the whole conversation about like, we need to, you know, do marches. And I, I believe in, 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 in doing marches and raising the issue to the forefront. But a march itself, in my opinion, isn't going to do a whole lot. You, you, there has to be boots on the ground. There has to be action. There has to be People sitting on lawmakers, you know, front doors, you need to be, you know, voting towards change. So what are the things that we need to do to stop seeing these things reoccur? Because racism, if you ask me, and it might be pessimistic of me, racism is never going to be fully eradicated. It's just, it's just not. I think, I, I think we can, we can, we can do things to bring it to light so that it's not as accepted, right? So we, we want to do things so it's not tolerated. But it's never going to go away. So for us to sit down and think we just need to do something until racism goes away, just just stop now because it's not going to happen. So what's practical? What are the practical things that we see that we can be done? Do you have any thoughts on on things that we should we can do or what should be done in the system that can help these issues go away? For sure. Uh, I think you're right. Racism is going nowhere. Mm -hmm. But 
we can shine a light on it yeah. and make sure that it's not cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to reference something that I haven't heard anyone else reference so far. But when I think, I'm old enough that when I think about the LGBTQ community and how much progress has been made, I was, I'm alive for when uh, everyone was called a name if they were gay. Mm-hmm. Um, no one was willing to be out. Uh, and all of a sudden, there's this movement that pick up speed. Mm-hmm. And it did start with marches. It mm-hmm. did start with pride festivals mm-hmm. and this sense of uh, I'm proud of my identity. Right. You know, I, I, have, I belong in this space just as much as anyone else does. Mm-hmm. But I think the thing that really made a change is when people got involved. Right. So when you start having city councilors, uh, mayors of cities, members of parliament, and leaders who are part of that community, you get a bigger voice. Mm-hmm. You get a bigger voice to move things in the direction that it should have always have been, mm-hmm. where everyone's human and everyone should be accepted. Everyone should be allowed to be who they are. Right. right? Uh, and so when I think about where we are now with this movement, uh, we've had too many start and stop moments. We've had too many times where... Um, Something big happens and it shakes the world and everyone pays attention, but it just fades after a period of time. Mm-hmm. A new story hits the news cycle and now everyone's covering something else. Um, we need people to step up, put themselves out there and get involved. Mm-hmm. You know, I agree to get off the sidelines after watching that disgusting video. Mm-hmm. You know, that I, I could no longer just sit back and say, Oh, that's so bad. You know, that's so terrible. What an awful thing. I'm doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm paying lip service to an issue that's going to affect me, my family, my friends for eternity if no one ever steps up and makes sure that this light is so bright on this issue that no one feels comfortable Mm -hmm. to be racist. No one feels comfortable to be prejudiced against another person based on how they look. If that light is bright, no one will do it because it will no longer be acceptable. It will no longer be cool. Uh, And police officers, you have a tough job. Um, I know a lot of my friends are probably going to see this podcast. And yes, I know I live in Canada. Mm -hmm. And yes, I know I never feel uncomfortable getting into my car and going anywhere. I never feel uncomfortable in Canada being on the highway and a police cruiser is driving behind me. Mm -hmm. I never feel uncomfortable. I trust our police to do the right thing. But I also know it's still human behavior. People have natural prejudices. I have them too. Implicit bias is real. Sometimes you prejudge someone based on a story you heard one time about them that is not even verified. And now you are like, yeah, that's who that person is forever. And you don't even know that story to be true. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying in Canada here that I feel this great apprehension Um, But I know in Canada, I still feel a need to stand up for everyone who is marginalized, Mm -hmm. whether that's people of color, whether that's LGBTQ. I live in downtown Toronto. And when I walk around at night, I'm no longer just seeing homeless people. Mm -hmm. I'm now seeing a large contingent of what I'm going to call displaced people because they have all their belongings with them. Some of them have MacBook computers. So clearly something has recently gone wrong for them. Mm -hmm. And now they're being harassed by, sorry, Kevin, security in all these buildings to get moving, Mm -hmm. to get out. Uh, Even though they're actually not harming anyone, they got to get out. Mm -hmm. Even though it's minus 25 outside, they got to get out. And I understand you, you can't have them sleeping in the building. But do you also have to make them feel worse about who they are? Do you also have to make them feel like they're not worthy of being alive? Do you have to talk down to them? Yell at them at the highest voice? Why not have a conversation with that person? You can see they're going through a difficult time. Here's your chance to be human. And talk to that person and reason with them. Let them know why they can't stay in the building. Hey, listen, generally you can stay for a few hours, but then I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to ask you to leave. You can't stay overnight. I think so, so, compassion. Yeah, I, wanna, I don't want to cut you off, but I, it, it's in me because there's two things I want to talk about right off of that. One, 
uh, personal experience of mine, having dealt with, dealt with that, and two, coming back to more the training side of things. Um, again, same thing many years ago, working up in the north end of the city, uh, late at night, about two o'clock in the morning, we got to lock up the building. There's an individual who's obviously uh, homeless or displaced and sitting inside the, the vestibule. And here again, you have a decision to make. I have a rule. The rule is we need to lock the building. That's the rule. I have two choices. Be so fixated on the rule that I'm not compassionate or have compassion and look at how I can, I'll say bend the rule, but quite frankly, I don't even call it bending the rule because again, it's when it comes to compassion, I don't really think it's really bending the rule. So individual, hey, I need you, I need you to leave. And he said, oh, you know, I don't really have anywhere to go. I said, do, do me a favor. Like, I can't have you, same thing. I can't have you here all night. I gotta, I gotta finish locking up the rest of the building. You got about 20 minutes to do that. Do you mind, you can just stay here for now, kind of get as much warm as you can, and then we'll help you figure out where to go. Went and did my rounds. Came back afterwards, he was still there. Said, okay, you know, at this point now, I need to, to ask you to go, but here's where you can go and give alternatives. It's not so much about just, well, get out, because it solves my problem. It's, you still have a, an, individual, an individual you have to be compassionate about. So gave him an alternative on a place to go where he could still remain warm, right? And, but he's not, my problem. Yeah. Right. So there's that. And it goes back to training because when I was managing at another place, that's actually an interview question that I would ask. And I would do it in two ways. And the first way that I would do it is I'd ask, I would say that there was a, there was a, a well-dressed businessman who was late at night waiting for an Uber and he needs to wait inside the building because it's minus 25 degrees outside in wintertime. He needs to wait inside the building until his, his car comes. What would you do? And a lot of people would say, oh, well, yeah, just it's only a few minutes. He's going to be there. I'll just let him wait. But then when you flip the script and it's a guy who's disheveled and he's got his bag and he's got his grocery cart. So, well, we got to lock up the building. Yeah. And I'm like, but why is it different? Like if, if the individual needs to go somewhere, give him a few minutes. Like you don't need to be in such a rush to follow the rules. And I think sometimes when it comes back to policing, there are so many little rules that you have to enforce or that you're allowed to enforce. Because I think that's the best way to say it. Yep. Like the building rule is to lock the door at two o'clock, but like I'm allowed to extend that if I need to, I can have that. So same thing with policing is, yeah, you have these rules because I'll, I'll jump to that. I know I'm all over the place, but like even this whole thing of like resisting arrest, like at what point, like there should be a threshold because technically if I say you're under arrest and you say, well, I'm not going with you, you're resisting arrest. Yeah. Now I can turn that, oh, now, you're now I'm starting to use all kinds of force, but there should be a threshold. A normal person does not want to be arrested. Right. A bad person or not, they don't want to be in handcuffs. Nobody likes their liberties taken away. So you've got to educate people on, on how to sort of have that compassion and, and wait till a certain threshold before you start following certain rules. There's got to be that buffer. There's too much black and white. and There needs to be a lot more gray. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is going to turn into a, uh, a race and power discussion. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm tremendously concerned about that the current situation in Toronto with displaced people just, I mean, can you imagine for a minute? Um, I know it, it might not be, it might not happen to us, but can you imagine if I lose my job, I have nowhere to live, and now I'm outside on the streets of Toronto. I got bags with me. I am feeling so low, mm -hmm. so low. And now I'm eating a meal and it's now 10 o'clock and I'm just sitting in a food court somewhere. I don't mind if you came to me and said, hey, listen, Handel, you can't stay here. Mm. You know, we don't allow homeless people to just sit here all night. You got you to gotta go. Okay. Fair enough. I'll go find another place until they chase me away. Right. But imagine my, my mindset and my position, and you come over to me and you start berating me and telling me uh, that I'm nothing. I'm worth less than everybody else. And you're screaming at me and yelling and just get out of here, right? I mean, what kind of person does that? What kind of person does that to another human? At this point, you're saying that person is not even human. You, have, you don't have to respect them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be compassionate. You don't have to like them. Mm -hmm. Your job is to bully them and make them feel worse about their situation. Mm -hmm. Some of them are dealing with mental issues where yelling is a big problem for them. Yeah. And now you're screaming at them for what? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you achieving? Like, how does this happen to someone that you get into this disposition where you think, you're entitled to do that to another human. It's because, and, and I think you mentioned it earlier, it comes back down to power. It's, it's that 
well, I'm the authority and I, I'm the one with the rules and the rights to have the rules. And you're just the peon that's supposed to listen to me and do what I tell you. And I think a lot of times we have people governing things by rules and regulations rather than by compassion. Yeah. And I get it. You can't be compassionate about everything because then you can, you can go completely the opposite way and everyone's just doing whatever they want. But it's, it's learning, it's, it's learning to, to work outside of that box it, and treat every situation as different. If, if everything is a cookie cutter solution, well, here's the rule, that's it. Here's the rule, that's it. Here's the rule, that's it. This is why people, because most people, when you say, excuse me, you got to leave, they'll go, oh, okay, sorry. And they'll walk away. And so when now someone says, well, no, I don't want to leave or no, I'm cold or I want to stay, people's backs get up right away because they're, they're also not used to being told no. And it's like, now you're being defiant. And it's like, okay, well, the last person probably had somewhere to go. So they don't mind leaving. This person doesn't have anywhere to go. They don't want to leave. So you don't just paint everyone with the same brush. And it's like, hey, well, let's have a, let's have a conversation. Do you have somewhere you can go? Because these are, the, these are the, the, the training that I know on the security side is happening, which is why I honestly believe we don't see as many of the incidents as we do in policing. And I'm not saying police aren't trained. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But we take a lot of time because I'm in management now. So I don't, I'm not the guy on the, on the ground arresting anybody. For us, our direction is like arrest is the absolute like last thing. Like all hell has to be breaking out before you even think about putting someone in handcuffs. That's our that's our training. And that's not just who I work for. It's it's our industry. It's yeah. it's a very serious thing to take someone's liberties away. And it needs to be because something is so egregious that you have no other option. Other than that, walk away. Yeah, I, I think um I heard some feedback from uh from a friend of mine about these uh deaths in America and wanting to reference that uh you know some of these people were criminal. Right? Um and my my uh my take on that is very simple. I don't think anyone gave the police the rights to take life. Right? Whether you've just robbed a store or not, I want police to be safe. So no one telling me that I'm saying I want police to be unsafe. Mm-hmm. I don't want a single police officer to be killed by anybody. Right. right? That's not. That's definitely what I don't want. And if I were a police officer, I would protect myself first. Right. So this is not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying this general idea that if you have committed a crime of any sort, that you've now given up your right to live. Mm-hmm. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if that were true, mm-hmm. we wouldn't need courts. Right. We wouldn't even need prison. Right. We just need a morgue. Mm-hmm. You rob someone, we kill you, we put you in the, in the ground. Yeah. It's over, right? Mm-hmm. That's not the job of police. Their job is to get the person to court so the person can be processed, mm-hmm. hopefully rehabilitated and back into society. Right. Policing was never meant to be, we need to snub out life. You don't need to like, run around and try to kill as many people as possible. Right. Right, it's still a fascinating topic in USA, not Canada, USA, um, of how somehow in America they can bring so many mass shooters who are Caucasian into custody without a scrape. Mm-hmm. It's like magic. Right. I just killed twenty people, and now you're going to put me into the cruiser very carefully. I don't even have a bruise on my face, but somehow. The black kid that stole something from Target now needs to be slammed to the ground, thrown into the car, pummeled by several officers, a committee of beatings before being sent off to be processed. Right. How are you taking these dangerous killers into custody without incident? How? I think that one's also a very interesting one for me because... On the surface of it, I sit back and I go, you're right. I'm, I'm with you 100%. It's how is it that these guys who are mass killers are getting you know, handcuffed and their heads tucked into the police car? And on the other side, people are getting slammed to the ground. But I, want, I wonder, I'm not excusing what happens, but I wonder if fortunately for some of these guys that we see that are the white guys that are getting treated properly, it's because, is it because, as we said earlier, not all police officers are bad police officers. And I would love to believe, and I, I think I truly in my heart believe, that the vast majority, there is more good cops than bad cops. That's my, honest, that's my honest opinion. People want to agree with me. I don't really care. That's my opinion. 
And so, you know, is it by chance that unfortunately we see, because first of all, we always see the negative before we see the positive. For sure. So, so there's a little bit of a trade-off, I think, where whatever is negative is going to get press, right? Um, and whatever sells stories is going to get going to press. But because there are so many good police officers, I, I, I think that there are still black people getting treated nicely by police. I don't think every black person is... Oh, for sure. Or, or every oh, minority is getting you know, ransacked I by a cop. I, I don't think that that's the case. Um, so I think it's partially because we do have good police officers. And I think there is a movement as well, especially in these mass killings. You're better off trying to take them alive than killing them because you're trying to understand why it happened. You can't investigate yeah. a guy who's dead. So uh, but, but, a, a higher ranking officer tried to explain to me this way. And he kind of convinced me and I listened for a little bit, but I still have trouble with that image. It's yeah. that image of this guy being carefully transported right. that doesn't sit well when the other guy who robbed Walmart is like being beaten up, right? right. Um, but he explained to me this way. He's like, uh, the reason why that happens is really simple. When you have a mass murder or a major incident like that, you're getting the most elite police responding. They know how to deal with yes. these situations. Yeah. Yeah. They know how to deal with it. They know how to get the guy in custody without much. These are guys who can storm an airplane and mm. take, take out hijackers yeah. and bring them back alive, right? Mm. So he's saying that's the difference. And it's, it's that, he thinks that, that that part's not as much race. And he's not saying there isn't racism. Mm. He accepts there's racism. Yes. He's just saying the reason why those killers tend to get in custody mm. is because your best officers are the ones pursuing them. Right. And they know what to do yeah. to contain someone, yeah. right? I, I would, I think I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with that hundred percent. I, it, it is knowing how police respond and how they're trained. Um, I've, I've been in active attacker situations, like uh, training situations with police, and I see how they respond and how they're trained to respond, and the, the eliteness, if that's even a word, the eliteness of, of how they respond, it's very calculated. Yeah, those guys are on a different level. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even, and, but even, even the regular cops are trained to a certain degree as well. Like your SWAT team is a whole other team. But even regular cops, that's a very specific type of a situation. You're every day kind of getting a call to go investigate the guy who is passing a fraudulent, alleged fraudulent $20 bill. Your average B cop is just, it's whoever kind of goes. But it still comes down to a training issue because at the end of the day, you always wonder, as we say, what's it's an alleged $20 bill. How did a $20 bill end up in a life being taken? Yeah. Um, Should be impossible. I think it, so. this is where I, I think I want to sort of go a little bit with, with this conversation is now it's how did that happen? Because when you start to see the investigation, you find that, okay, uh, I think Chauvin or whatever has been on the force for 19 years or whatever it is, yeah. however long. He's been on the force for so long. He's had all these complaints against him, right? He's had these investigations against him and nothing was done, no files, no, no, no charges filed. And I think when we start to look at some of the deep rooted issues is I look at a lot of these different situations and not every single one of them, but a lot of them, when they do the investigation, the police officer has been on the job for many, many years, yep. sort of a senior officer or veteran officer, Number of complaints. Now, I'm sure the number of complaints can obviously be relative to how long they've been on the force. So I'm not going to sure. say that just because you've been on the force 19 years and you had, you know, 18, maybe it's one per year. I don't know. But how do we get people out of the police force? Because one say, oh, stop hiring white cops. Well, that's not that's not the answer. That makes no sense. It's kind of, it doesn't work. So how do we stop people from going from the nice, kind hearted police officer to the one who kills somebody? And this is where I think some of the conversation and things that need to be changed starts. Because I'm finding that when you have people, I, I say police officers are like guys in the military, right? You work a really crappy job. And when I say crappy job, I'm talking about you deal with a lot of stuff that a lot of us would not want to deal with. You're dealing with anyone who is from your most bottom line displaced person to presidents and CEOs and whatever. And you're dealing with domestics, you're dealing with murders, you're dealing with suicides, you're dealing with all kinds of stuff. You see a lot of crap throughout your years. And I think over time, I, I compare that to the military, it's like a guy who goes, fights in a war, yeah. and he's at war for two, three years. And everything around him is guts and glory and, and bombings. That's why they have PTSD, right? yeah. that, that connection. 
And I think a lot of police officers too, they, they work a job where they're exposed to so much. When do they really get a break? Yeah. And I think over time, is there a switch? Is there a point in where you've gone from, I'm a normal human being who can process things to someone who is now so desensitized. Could be lost in the job for sure. Right? Yeah. And, and this is where I pull race out of it a little bit. Yeah. Yes, we're not taking it away because I know that that's in there. But take that away for a second. You're dealing with someone who deals with crap on an everyday basis. Yeah. At some point, their their mind is skewed. For sure. Can, can you imagine being a cop uh, in uh, a, a neighborhood where everything's highly charged all the time? And you go to work, you do your shift, and you almost pick up the same guys over and over and over. And they get arrested and they get processed and they're back out again. Mm-hmm. And then you work your shift next week and there is him again, here's again, another call. You go back, you pick them up and over and over. That can wear on, on these guys. Absolutely. You know, you're chasing these guys through alleys over and over and over again. It's the same guy. Right. You keep arresting him and nothing happens. He's back out again. So the, the, the reform is going to be wide. It's not just going to be about uh, police training, some of the court system. Everything has to come into play now mm-hmm. to figure out how can we make this better for everybody. Right? And, and, you know, when I, say, when I say this and someone was saying earlier, was talking about mental health and, and – you know, none of this excuses police officers for bad behavior. So we just need to put that out there. But what mental health challenges do the police have? Because to me, I think for you, when I look at that video of George Floyd, you have to have some sort of a mental incapacity to think that you can kneel on someone's neck for that long. You look at the video, he's just chilling. He's not, there's no, George is not resisting there's, there's, he's like, he's got nothing to do. He's just yep. post up. Like there has to be something not right there. Like there, I, I don't understand how you could just do that. A yeah. normal human being who is just compassionate, it just doesn't work. So I think this is what I'm saying. I think they go through their own mental health issues. And at what point do they need to be separated from those jobs? Because I think maybe that's one of the solutions is maybe that policing, it shouldn't be a long-term career. Or, or you move around, different roles. You move around to You get in the roles. desk for a while, you, you know, you do something different. To switch it yeah. up. I think that's something that needs to happen. I look at, I don't know about, I don't know about in America, but I also look at here in, in Canada. And again, this is not a, this is not an anti-union thing, but you have people whose job is to uphold the law. And we know that there are bad seeds in the bunch. Is it feasible to remove the police from being unionized? Because at the end of the day, think of it you as, a, as an employee at any organization. You go to work and you're supposed to do your job with the utmost integrity. Because quite frankly, if you don't, there's a chance that you're going to be rightfully dismissed like that. Yeah. Why is that not the same in policing? If your job is to protect and you've been on the force and you, do, you go to work every single day and you do the job to your best of your absolute ability. It's not, I can go to work and I can make an error and my boss can come to me and say, you know what? You made an error. I don't want to see that again, but I still have my job yeah. because it's not such an egregious error. It's not like I'm embezzling money or something like, you know what right. I mean? So if I, if I do my job with integrity and honesty, I'm going to have a job for a long time. I don't have anything to worry about. If I'm the employee who's trying to sneak around and cut corners and then I'm the guy that needs to worry, but hopefully my boss is going to go, I don't like that. It's wrong. Change out of here. Oh, you're gone. Yeah. But this is where, how do these, you know, you keep seeing the, the same repetition, the same complaints on the same police officer over years and years and years, and yet they still have the job. I don't get it. No accountability. And they have the union standing right behind them the whole way. So they have, they have nothing to worry about. I, I was saying to someone that, um, you know, the union is like having a defense lawyer. A defense lawyer's job isn't necessarily to say that their client isn't guilty. Unless, of course, it's something that's really obvious that the person's like, but their job isn't necessarily to say the person's not guilty. You're trying to help that individual really get the less penalty for the crime that they committed or are alleged to have committed, right? So if I did something wrong, I have a defense lawyer, I might have to tell my lawyer, like, yeah, you know what? I killed that guy or I did something. Yeah. Now, my lawyer is going to look at all the technicalities and, and, try, and see what he yeah. can do to get me the best possible solution to resolve that issue, right? That's what the union's job is, is, yeah, I'm not going to say that I applaud you for doing it, but as your representation, 
I'm going to have to work to make sure you don't get fired and maybe you get penalty, but you're not going to get fired. Get rid of that. So yeah. now the, the only thing that really keeps a cop in his, high, in his high morals and ethics is his own personal integrity. Because once that starts to wean, then there's that risk and the, the job of the, the police chief or whoever it is to cut corners with that guy or cut ties with that guy and say, look, you're out of here. Right. So those are the types of things that I, I would love to see a conversation about just out there as we're all kind of trying to find ways to bring reform to policing and, and to um, some of the things that we're seeing is let's start looking at the internal ways that police are governed and yeah. hold them accountable. And that's one of the ways I think you can start holding them accountable. Oh, for sure. So, Kevin, we're, we're going to have to continue this conversation for sure. But before we go. What are you willing to commit to today in terms of what are you going to do to help affect this change that we so desperately need? For me right now, it starts with finding out how exactly I can get involved. Because as much as I sit here and I'm, I'm invested to say, let me be part of the change, it's finding out, like I know there's, there's networks that I'm associated with. Um, some of them are law enforcement related. So it's being able to speak to officers um, I'm willing to, like, even right now, I, I realize I have a platform, right? Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, there are things that I'm doing and it, it's about creating the conversation. I think one of the things we have to do is continue to keep people talking about what's going on. So my commitment is to be as loud, be as loud about the issue as we can, as I can. Um, you know, when it comes to, there was, there's been a time where I've been a little bit lackadaisical when it comes to voting. Um, not just government wise, but just different things that I'm, I'm able to vote on, but it's, it's finding out what do I need to do and, and how do I need to do it? I don't really have a big long list of here are the 10 things I'm going to do. The one thing I know is I'm absolutely committed. Number one, to even educating myself. I think that's, that's the key thing. I can't sit here and say, well, just cause I'm black, I know all the info because there's stuff that I don't know about. Yeah. It's how do things work? It's engaging conversations with people. It's, you know, people say the fact that you have two ears and one mouth means you should be quicker to listen than to speak. So finding ways to listen um, to, to whether it be, you know, whether it's not the media or just other conversations with people that I know, like yourself, um, really, number one, educating myself. Number two is finding the ways that I can be involved. I, I've always had somewhat of a, I don't want to say a negative opinion, People you see these petitions that get sent around on Facebook or something yeah, like that. And, and I'm like, eh. but you know what? At the same time, well, what does it hurt? What if it, what if it can do something? What does it really take for me to spend two seconds of my time to sign a petition if I really believe that it's towards a better thing? That is also getting off the sidelines where, you know, not, not just to yeah. assume, ah, oh, it's just some rubbish. Well, accept that maybe it is something and add my name to it. Um, like I said, I don't really have a long list of here are my, here's my to-do list, but I'm absolutely committed to using whatever platform I have to discuss the issue, talk about the issue, not let it die, be more vocal, um, try to get more involved. You know, I, I made a comment earlier about marches. That doesn't mean I don't like marches or I don't think that they're not effective at all. I think I'd be foolish to say that. There have been a lot of marches in this world, especially for civil rights, that have made significant improvements. So getting where I can, being more involved in those types of things, right? So I, it just really, I'm open. Is I guess the best way for me to really answer that question is I'm open to doing whatever I humanly can because I also don't want to say I'm only going to do these things because then you pigeonhole yourself into just that. So I'm really open is really what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean... Uh... For me, I'm going to say my commitment is I'm no longer going to do nothing. Right. That, that stopped 10 days ago. Yeah. I'm no longer going to do nothing. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to mobilize my friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to encourage them to participate in the conversation regardless of their background. Right. Uh, because this conversation is for everybody. Yeah. And we all benefit if we're having this conversation. Right. We must shine this bright light on it. Mm -hmm. We must get involved in politics because we need to elect more people who are interested in having this tough conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we need to ensure that at the grassroots level that we're involved in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, in Ontario here, we've started building a lot of these rec centers and communities. And I've seen how that's impacted the community because what you're having now, because the facilities are so great, 
you're having kids of all backgrounds coming together to play in these centers. Mm -hmm. This is very positive for our future because they're already learning how to get along at an early age. Mm -hmm. And there's, there isn't this uh, stigma of black, white, East Indian, Chinese. It's just basketball. Yeah. We're just playing basketball. That's all we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we need more of that. So I, I'm coming off the sidelines. Mm -hmm. I'm getting what I'm going to call extremely involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not shying away from tough conversations. Right. For too long, I have found myself maybe not speaking up mm -hmm. when someone's mm -hmm. having an opinion that just seems right. somewhere between inhumane and uh, disgusting. Yeah. And me deciding to be politically correct and not challenge that person. Right. That's over now for me. Yeah. Uh, I have to be involved. I have to be willing to, to own it. And I'm going to own it. And I'm going to challenge you that when we get together again, uh, that we're going to hold each other accountable. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about what we achieved mm -hmm. since the last time we sat down and had this conversation. Yeah. What did we do? Yeah. Did we just have this conversation then go back to our lives? Right. Or did we go do something? Mm -hmm. What specific thing did we do since we last had this talk? Yeah. And I think that's going to help both of us uh, really impact change. And I'm, I'm down for that. You know, I think the best way to, to see changes is to actually hold people accountable because it's very easy for, for all of us to, in the, in the moment, in the emotion, oh, yeah, like, rah, rah, rah. And then, like you said, the weather changes and you're just like, okay, on to the next thing. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's how we affect changes, by being involved because then you're actively participating in something and it's not just a thought. Yeah. Because you're going to get more out of what you do than what you say, so... I'm absolutely down for that. Awesome. And for anyone who's, who's going to watch this and maybe ask themselves what they can do, especially if they feel like, is this my issue because I'm not black? Or maybe they are black. Here's what I'm going to say. What should you do? You should be part of the conversation. You should join the conversation. You should now be willing to ask uncomfortable questions. You should now be willing to oppose un unpopular positions by other people who have decided that they want to focus on uh, the riots. Uh, I mean, the G7, the G20, no matter where they gather, mm -hmm. riots come with it. Right. But the protest is important because of the messaging. Mm -hmm. The riots are a separate issue altogether. Um, I need anyone who wants to get involved to get involved. You don't need permission to get involved. You don't need me to say, yeah, you can join this cause. Yeah. Anyone can get involved. Mm -hmm. And getting involved is really about speaking up. Getting involved is really about being compassionate. Mm -hmm. uh, getting involved, if you're on the sidelines right now, means come out of your bubble. Live in the real world. Experience the world for all that it is. Good, bad, and indifferent. Stop pretending that the world is just this perfect place. We live in Canada. We don't have to worry about anything. Life is great. That's only because you have your blinkers on. Right. You're missing an opportunity to make an, a difference. Mm -hmm. If every person, if every person just makes himself accountable for one other person, mm -hmm. we will conquer this problem in a short time. Right. And that's just about compassion. Like I say, for security guards out there, and you're working in a mall, and someone is going through a tough time in their life, compassion. Yeah. Remember that word, compassion. Mm -hmm. That's how you can help. Yeah. That's all part of this message. If people are compassionate to each other, we aren't going to behave like this. Right. We're going to watch someone take someone's life and think it's acceptable in any way, shape, or form because there are no cameras. Mm -hmm. We're going to feel something. We're going to be like, no, that, this isn't right. Yeah. We're going to feel something. So if you want to get involved, there's no permission required. Mm -hmm. Jump in. Right. Have the conversation. Share your message with even one person. Mm -hmm. That's going to shine a light on, on the bad behavior we're seeing from humans. I don't want to say police anymore because it's a human condition, not really a police condition. Yeah. Anyone who can do that, uh, this is a human issue. It's not about the uniform he's wearing. He's embarrassing their uniform, quite frankly. Right. Um, and I would like to think that other officers wouldn't look at him and think he's being unfairly prosecuted. Right. I think they'd like to look at him as a guy who's embarrassed them. Mm -hmm. He's made all of their jobs more difficult. So, Tenfold. Yeah, just, yeah. Just get into the conversation. Be a part of it. No permission required. Uh, we're going to reconnect. We're going to be accountable for what we said we we're going to do. Yeah. And then uh, join us again on the 846 podcast. Uh, and may Mr. Floyd uh, rest in peace eternally. And uh, 
definitely a prayer to his family uh, for comfort. And hopefully they're getting a chance to grieve properly. And all of this uh, change that's happening in the world isn't stopping them from taking a moment to grieve as well. So, Kevin, it's been a blast. It has been a blast. Thank you very much. Can't wait to do it again. Yeah, This is the absolutely. best. All right. All right. All Thank you. Time. Take care.